So everything I said relies on and the steadiness on the flow being important. And this is exactly what I was just discussing with Mosan. So at which point uh, these uh, non-stationary terms kick in, uh, the parameter that defines this is uh, the reduced frequency. The reduced frequency is, is a normalization of the frequencies of motion of the uh, airfoil with uh, the characteristic time scale on the fluid. Okay, In linear dynamic elasticity, all the unsteady nets by definition comes from the boundary conditions. So you leave the flow by itself and the airfoil doesn't move, everything becomes steady and nice which is not true in real flows, but this is the assumption that we, we get through in, in potential flow theory. So what we do have is the uh, normalization of that characteristic frequency of motions uh, with a characteristic uh, uh, frequency of their dynamics, uh, the inverse of a time scale, being a, a way to normalize those effects and see at which point uh, an steady effects become important. So if this becomes very small, very very close to, to zero, then you have a steady situation. The, the airfoil is moving at a low speed for the flow that goes around not to see changes. If this moves fast enough, as the flow goes through, we see something which is moving, and then is when we have those uh, those interactions. So you, you know something as well is if the airfoil moves very fast, the flow will not remain attached, and then therefore all these assumptions of potential flow theory, in particular the invisible assumption, wouldn't work. So there is a range of operation of potential flow theory in which things are valid, and typically is presented to be between 0 and 0 0.6 on these normalized uh, frequency of motions. Good news is that for most relevant applications, this is within well within uh, the domain of, of motions. It's very fast. 0 0.6 and convective time scale actually very fast dynamics for the airflow moving, which is typically not uh, found. Okay, so as I was saying before, so out of this potential flow theory, what we end up with is a way to compute the aerodynamic forces uh, due to motions of the airfall. So just to put everything together, uh, wrong computer. What I did here is to basically put together how a typical aeroelastic uh, system description looks like. So on the top, what we have is what I started. I added dump into the problem. You have the structure, linear structural equations. But when everything I'm saying here is linear, as you have noticed. So mass stiffness dumping of the structure with Q, the degrees of freedom we had before. If you have more degrees of freedom on the system, the structure is still retained. Typically, you have mold shapes of a structure, and they still you have very similar equations. Then the dynamics become more complex. We have this dependency of the dynamic pressure. Uh, the dependence of the convective time scales that normalize how things are, are moving in, in time with respect to the aerodynamics. So the way we normally put them together is by identifying the terms associated to acceleration of the boundary conditions. U becomes both Q, and you have flaps. We have flaps as well into that uh, uh, inputs to the aerodynamics. Any way in which the, the shape can change on the fluid. So we have terms, and these are linear constants for, for scaling constants, associated to uh, the accelerations of the flow. Terms, which are going to be associated to velocities on uh, sorry, uh, accelerations on the boundary conditions on the solid. Terms, which are going to be proportional to the velocity of the solid. And this is one you manipulate everything I said before. We have terms, which are going to be proportional to the displacements. In state aerodynamics, or state elasticity, we saw that this effectively is the angle of attack. Uh, uh, restoring forces. But then you have many other terms which come from the internal dynamics on the flow, mainly those equations we need to solve on the wake. So the way normally this is done is by fitting those in terms of uh, first order rational function approximations. So all these previous equations which are linear, you can approximate by a structure in which you have a bunch of uh, dampers uh, or dissipating systems which uh, 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 add, uh, uh, capture those those physics. Uh, that's how it typically gets consolidated into a, an integral equation. No inter well, not integral, uh, the equation that in in includes everything. So once we have that, then what we will do is to put everything together in a single equation. So we have the effective aerolastic mass, so the mass both from the fluid and the the structure, which actually and multiply the acceleration term. So when you move the airfoil, it will have the restoring forces of the fluid as well as the restoring forces of the 
uh, uh, solid itself. So we have a uh, effective mass, effective damping, effective stiffness on the structural degrees of freedom, which are still the one driving the problem. All these additional aerodynamic states uh, we introduced to capture everything, and this is the circulation information and the wake information. And then we'll have the left hand side of the problem, which becomes the flap inputs, as well as the derivatives. If the flap is moving fast, aerodynamic effects are going to be proportional as well to the acceleration of the flap. So we need to, to incorporate those into, into the problem. At that point, this becomes a linear equation with lots of things we don't know and a few things we do. So what we do is to basically build up a huge state, state, state vector with displacements, velocities, and all the air information and the first two derivatives of the flaps, which are going to be driven by the, the highest derivative, and then we manipulate the full system to basically write in a state space form. Uh, this is going to be massively dependent on the operations in which we are having the R, the R4. So what we have is an our elastic state uh, system, uh, which in which the coefficients are going to be dependent on the operating point, which is always parameters on the problem. So the density and the velocity in which uh, we perform. Now these, you know what to do with it. You fit into your linear control uh, framework of, of uh, of choice, and you're able to obtain an elastic system uh, with uh, controls. So things that actually come out of this is the stability of the linear system. In elastic terms, this is referred to as flatter. Uh, static stability of the elastic system. In elastic terms, this is the, uh, referred to as the virgin. And then the ability to basically generate control that manipulates the system. And then you can look into any metric of controllability or any choice of feedback to improve performance or move the poles or stabilize the flutter, uh, you name it. It's very often the case that is taken that the flap is, is constrained to move relatively slowly. And then we may have a case in which the flap becomes a quasi steady uh, input into the problem. So to put a, a nice example of, of this, I. I brought this whole movie. This is a wind on the wind tunnel. Uh, and this is basically our elasticity in, in, in a two minute video. So you take a wing, you put it on the wind tunnel. This is flexible because it's big and it's very slender. So it will deform by its own weight. That's what you get to see there. Then uh, the way they were doing this test that was done in Duke some 20 years ago, uh, they will increase slowly the velocity of the flow, in the wind tunnel. Then as you would expect to see, and I can probably accelerate this a bit, is as they increase the velocity, this wind starts to move up. Uh, leaf starts to take over these uh, uh, the gravity-driven forces. Uh, and then you see also it will all, all, always oscillate a bit. Okay, And this is because uh, no wind tunnel is perfect. There is always some turbulence on the atmosphere. And this is turbulent-driven excitation. There is fluctuations on the incoming velocity. And a flexible wind is very sensitive to those. So you will see the wind always exciting. And as you as you get to see, the wind starts going up until at some point uh, around one, and I think it's about here, suddenly the speed becomes the uh, flutter speed, the system becomes unstable. And this is a sudden change of stability. The eigenvalue of the system move is slowly migrated and it moved to the right of the airfoil. I can see that the movie in teams actually is the, the, the frame rate is not good enough, so this will be moving much faster than actually you get to see. Have the two computers here, and then what you have is these dramatic oscillations. In this case, it's a flatter point which very quickly gets damped, so it has a, a saturation point, so it becomes a, a, an eigenvalue which becomes unstable, but the nonlinear system becomes a limit cycle oscillation and then it stays there. Uh, so, this is not typically something you see in wind turbines that's got. But it's a problem which is increasingly looked at as the wind turbines become larger, because they may encounter these situations. So it's, it's, there's a risk of those. Now, everything I said so far is two-dimensional, uh, but this is how the wake of uh, a rotor uh, looks like. This is by, by Jorgos Deskos, which was a postdoc in my lab up the, until last year. So this is a full uh, LEA simulation of a rotor uh, with the evolution of the wake. Uh, and then how the wake actually uh, breaks once you go several uh, rotor, uh, diameters downstream. One feature to see is that uh, these physics here and the near wake 
actually are very, very clean. And this is very well captured by potential flow. It's, it's one of those things. It's a very good approximation for anything that has to do with this sort of flow dynamics. The difference is, is not two-dimensional. It's, it's heavily three-dimensional. So the models for this need to accommodate uh, for, the, for those effects, of course. So what we will have, uh, and I'm talking as, as from, the, from the point of view of uh, our elasticity, are two very distinct problems. One is the near field problem, the, the, the problem of what happens to a, a, a rotor which is interacting with an incoming flow and is deforming, as, as I was defining before. Uh, locally, this problem can be very well approximated by these uh, uh, potential flow models. And the shape of the potential flow model in this case is what I'm showing there. This is a unsteady vortex lattice approximation. What we are modeling here is the blades, three blades, and the wake. And what you get to see is a discretization of a, a, a wake, which in this case will have this shape that you just saw on this uh, uh, three-dimensional movie. So the wake on a, on a rotor is not flat, becomes uh, uh, helicoidal uh, in first approximation. So what we do is, is to basically model uh, our vortex in the wake using this discretization as well as the, the, the vorticity on the rotor. And this is the essence of these unsteady vortex lattice methods that we've been using in, in, in my group. Uh, the second problem is if you care about what happens to that wake when it reaches the next uh, uh, rotor downstream and so on and so forth. In that case, potential flow models are no longer good. Uh, so what we do in, in that case is we actually care about the features of the wake and the ability of the wake to basically break and go through a different rotor. Uh, and those models are a different order of magnitude and complexity. So we are doing those using uh, direct simulation of the Navier-Stokes equations. You can still have rotors which are deforming. And that's indeed something we're working on as well. So we have these very large domains in which we are solving the full flow on the full 3D. This problem is a billion degree freedom uh, kind of simulation is, is massive scale. Uh, and then locally, each of those may actually be interacting with the flow in its own way. So we have a, a local model of the wind turbine uh, that uh, allows for, for local deformation. So the focus on, on, on most of the things I'm talking, however, is on the things on the on the left, of course. So, oh, I click on the wrong button. Hold on. Uh, I don't know where I click on. Give me, there you go. So how this then looks like. So what we have is uh, models for analysis, which are based on these potential flow models. Then we need equally models for the structure, which basically capture the main physics. So I think most of you at some level have looked across, uh, have came across a beam model. So most of the wind uh, turbine elasticity is built on wind models. So the structure, this is a structural model. What we do is characterize all the structural elements as one-dimensional elements that can move in space, and then we just put the stiffness between them. Uh, this is, the, of course, the error model. The combination of the two with a rotating frame, and in this case, we put this on a moving foundation, becomes a, the couple problem that we need to, uh, to, to simulate in our elasticity. Uh, a, f a, a key feature of this is that, by definition, all these problems will be uh, solving in time domain. It's very hard to come across situations in which this can be done uh, frequency domain because you have a relatively complex dynamics and interaction of flows. What drives these problems is normally the incoming flow speed, which is coming upstream from, from the airfoil. If the wind turbine is moving, it's because this is not a clean flow. So it has several features. The first one is you are on the boundary layer of the atmosphere. So actually, I can do what I did before. Let me see here. Uh, so if I have my rotor here, what we have is first the fact that we are on the atmospheric boundary layer. This is the ground. That's my rotor. And that's how the actual incoming flow velocities uh, look like. So as the wind turbine goes, through a cycle of, 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 of motions, you will see different velocities at different uh, altitudes. The second is that, by all means, this is not nice and smooth. 
this has a lot of time domain fluctuations. We refer to this as uh, uh, atmospheric turbulence. So on top of these large scale changes, which are cyclic, we have small scale changes which are dynamic and not linked in any way to to the altitude, or not fundamentally linked to the altitude. So you have randomness on those excitations. So the wind turbine will be need to be uh, basically designed against uh, uh, on those cases. And third, when the wind turbines become very large, we have a, uh, a third effect, which is driven by, by the gravity of the forces. When the wind turbine is vertical, the forces are on the axis, uh, on the along the axis of the wind turbine, when the wind turbine becomes horizontal, the forces are perpendicular to it. And through the cycle, that ratio between the forces becomes again another cyclic load, which is uh, quite substantial. So all these effects uh, combined make for the problems to be very uh, uh, fundamentally dynamic in, in nature. And on top of this, of course, then you have this the interaction between the structural dynamics to those external force in terms. So uh, to move from the 2D problems that I looked at into the 3D problems, uh, we have fundamentally uh, two different strategies. The one is that what I just defined before, you discretize everything, that's this unsteady vortex lattice. Uh, that's a very expensive proposition for engineering analysis. So in our, in our lab, indeed, we have to do a lot of work in model reduction associated to those methods. So for a long time, the tools that have been used for design of wind turbines are based on, on, on simpler uh, descriptions to that one. So the first uh, tool which is used to do three-dimensional modeling of, of rotors is what is referred to as to enter uh, this model. What you do in this case, I put this, this plot at the beginning, is you do a, a conservation of uh, momentum uh, between the in, inflow and the outflow on a long tube. So you assume that what uh, these are streamlines of flow and everything that happens inside has to conserve momentum. You take a, a, a volume of, of flow. So as I said at the beginning, what goes in goes out. If this flow gets decelerating, implies that you need to change, uh, increase the area. And the second, the power associated to wind through the disk is going to be uh, linked directly to the uh, local uh, change of momentum uh, multiplied the velocity. So that gives you a very quick estimate of how much power you should be able to extract from a wind energy, uh, from a wind um, and turbine. Uh, good news, it goes at the cube of the velocity. You want to put this at the most, uh, highest speed you can. Second, once this, the speed is fixed, because that's what you get from a particular condition, so what you can do is to increase the area. A feature that you would expect to see there is that as the speed uh, moves uh, from upstream to downstream, then as you reach the rotor, it will have a velocity which is smaller than the actual velocity you have upstream. So we refer to this as the induced factor, A1, which is how much has decelerated the flow from the wind speed to the point in which you have uh, the rotor plane. So actuator disks are the first thing you should look for when you're actually trying to estimate the, the power. Just by looking at the power uh, at the at the site and the particular availability of wind turbines, you can estimate how much power you can get out of a particular location. It's not sufficient to do uh, uh, design. So this is basically uh, modulated by what is called the blade moment of theory. What blade moment of theory does is to assume that it's not a single tube uh, with a constant induction factor. What you have is multiple uh, uh, annulus of uh, tubes, so basically layers of an onion as you go at different radial locations on the wind turbine, and each of those you have a different induction factor. Uh, so you make that one a function of R. Uh, and you use for each of those onion layers, uh, you have uh, the conservation of, uh, of, of mass and momentum that was referring about before. So blade moment of theory, basically what it does is generates this distribution of induction factor uh, to estimate what is the local velocity you will have on the flow. And then uh, locally solve the potential flow equations to estimate what's going on on the turbine. So you superimpose that uh, uh, those tubes which define what is the local conditions on each of the airfalls by one of these cartoons here, and I put the full cartoon as it's normally presented, I probably worth spending a bit of time on it, on what is that a particular uh, airfall says. So what a particular airfall says will be first, this is an airfall on an incoming flow which will be coming uh, from the bottom down, uh, UW being the wind velocity. 
it is spe it's it's spinning at a angular velocity a omega and this therefore is a particular location r so you have is the relative velocity being uw times uh, uh, combined uh, as a vector combination uh, addition with uh, omega r then you have the induction effect the fact that this is on the rotor and this has a small decrease in velocity which basically generate the effective in incoming velocity on the flow uh, sometimes on these models you can add an effect which is referred to as swirl. Swirl is simply the acceleration of the flow that happens on the radial velocity because there is a, 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 a spinning of the flow to go on the wind turbine. And that basically is yet another uh, if, uh, small effects which are uh, uh, a small addition of velocity on, the, on, on this axis. Uh, so we add the swirl into the uh, incoming flow on the horizontal velocity, and the combination of the two becomes actually what is the flow that the wind turbine is saying. Okay, this vector I'm drawing there is what the wind turbine says uh, instantaneously. Then there will be an angle of attack, alpha, between the wind, the, the blade, uh, and that incoming flow speed, and that will generate a lift, and it will generate a drag, and you want that lift to be pointing forward such that it propels the airfoil. And you can get the numbers such that these things add up, uh, and you want the drag to be as small as possible, as I was discussing before. So in these, at the local level, what we have then is an airfoil, which then we solve with the tools I was discussing before. If it's things are moving, it becomes a steady airfoil theory. Uh, but with a modification, which is this induced factor, which comes from the uh, global picture, this blader momentum uh, description. Uh, this becomes an iterative process between the two. So we solve the local airfoil, obtain the lift, obtain the thrust, then put that lift into the global picture to see how much momentum we are extracting and match the two of them, such that the, induce, uh, the induction becomes uh, the one that equilibrates the, the particular lift. So this is a very, very simple kind of model to build. It's way cheaper than this unsteady vortex lattice, so this is used uh, to do uh, first approximations, but it does have Many, many, very many approximations. It's fundamentally two dimensional, which is a, a huge restriction in, in complex flows. Uh, there is no need for any of you to run uh, to code this, at least you are trying to learn. So, this has been for a long time uh, embedded into codes which are very easy to access. So, there is a, a proprietary software called Bladed, uh, distributed by a company called Garat Hassan, which has been in this business for many, many years. And there is an open source uh, version by NREL, the the National Renewable Energy Labs in, in the States, which is called FAST. So any of you that has an interest on, on trying to do predictions on wind turbine, this is a, a very simple to use a piece of code to, to put all these uh, theories in, in practice. Uh, so once we have these very simple models, uh, then what is that you do? This is uh, an example that I took from, from a paper of Carlo Botasso, how they do optimization of blade design. So this becomes a problem in which you need to basically simultaneously size the structure, uh, size the dynamic shape, and make sure that they meet minimum mass performance, which is going to be the, the metric for uh, uh, how much is the cost, as well as minimum cost of operation, which is the fundamental metrics that uh, you will need to put on, on, on the design aspects. Uh, locally, wind turbine blades are typically having a, a very hollow structure, you see this thing, but there's almost nothing inside. So you need a way to extract these wind properties out of those uh, physical parameters. Wind turbine blades are made of composites, uh, uh, fiberglass composites, being fiberglass carbon being the, 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 the standard one. Uh, and, and then what uh, you would expect to see on a beam model is you have a lot of elastic coupling. So all these very simple models based on uh, diagonal constants become uh, not uh, not sufficient. So you have uh, uh, what is referred to as six by six stiffness matrix. Uh, once you have that, then you you build those properties into uh, a beam model, uh, uh, which basically will have bearing properties as you go around. Uh, you embed those into a full uh, wind turbine model with all these uh, aerodynamic models, and then uh, do a lot of dynamic tests under all those conditions I was referring before, and then obtain a lot of uh, uh, time histories of uh, loads and fatigue forces. Uh, then, of course, it is these people here were doing optimization. What we do is uh, to put some constraints on the problem, things that you would like to see, and then try to optimize for performance. Once you're at that point, 
then you want to see whether actually the optimum that you obtain is, is, is physical. So the next stage is you build a full model of the blade. Uh, typically, it's a full finite element model of the blade and a full CFD model of the blade to actually see what is the, the refinement you can achieve and, and the, the validity of your estimates that you use on the initial, initial uh, optimization. And out of these, uh, you have your uh, a standard kind of uh, design outcomes. Uh, there is a final phase in all this, which is going to high fidelity uh, simulations. As I said, uh, a key thing missing in our, in our elasticity and everything I said before is drag, and drag at some point becomes the key driver, which is what is the optimal aerodynamic shapes to maximize uh, the, the power output. That, at the end of the day, comes from that. So in that case, uh, this is an example of how this is typically done. What, uh, the, the next stage is you model the full rotor, and, or you use symmetry. You can get away with a, a, a single uh, blade on uh, periodic boundary conditions as a, a, as a flexible approximation to be able to model uh, local things. Uh, so the local effects on the wind turbine uh, uh, without a huge expense. Uh, B models are still fundamentally there. They, the, the, the key parameter, and then the optimization on the CFDs on the aerodynamic shape that you will go around. So all these models are basically very expensive on the CFD, very cheap on the structure. Uh, and at that point, you will have the ability to do a very detailed uh, power output predictions. So I, I thought I, I should say uh, a few things about uh, fast. Uh, well, let me see this, I'm moving back and forth. So all I've been saying is basically focus on the rotor, um, but it's not the only problem you need to solve for. So uh, the fast software, which is the, the design software for NREL, uh, does the whole lot. So it does the rotor, so there is, there is a rotor element into this, which is only one block there. Then the rotor may actually link to well, it is linked to an SL for which there is a model, mainly a drive train dynamic model. Then the tower is moving on top of it, so you have that one linked to this, and all of these becomes the structural dynamic models of the tower uh, tower rotor uh, system. And they are intimately intimately linked for any of these very large wind turbines. The tower is is moving, and the oscillations of this tower are driving the rotor dynamics, and and those interactions can become very very essential. There is then, uh, you enter the domain of the civil engineers. It's the fact that actually this is attached to the ground and the ground has foundation. So in NREL, at, this, at the time I put this out, it wasn't available, but uh, I'm working for, with colleagues in civil engineering here, which actually work on, on that area. So there is huge interaction between this going on the foundation part of the problem, how you attach the tower to the ground and what's going on uh, on the tower itself. And there you end all, all the way to soil. And all these things became more and more intricately linked on the, the very large wind turbines. Alternatively, you can have a wind turbine which is on a, on a floating environment, in which case you will re replace all the soil models by hydrodynamic models, and that's basically what was linked there. So it becomes a, a, a beautiful kind of problem in, in, in computational uh, design to bring all the physics into the problem just to do the model of the platform. Then, of course, you have the control aspects on it. Uh, and those typically come in, in, in two ways. One is you have the local uh, control on the on the wind turbine, which basically manipulates the, the pitch uh, of the blades and the, the uh, speed of operation uh, through, through manipulating the, the, uh, the, the features on the, on the generator. And then you have the global a farm scale in which you are looking into ways of uh, looking at the interfacing between the various wind turbines. I'll put some examples of this in the end. Uh, and all of those becomes again in very closely linked to details of each of the models that come into, into the bits and pieces that I put in there. So at that stage, our elasticity, which is what I'm designing here, becomes just this block here, and it has to feed into many other things uh, which are as important. So I was only focusing on, on a very particular part of the problem. Um, I put a, a cartoon of how we do this ourselves. 
So I was referring to this before already, but uh, this is a higher fidelity model than than this uh, uh, blade element momentum theory analysis. What we do is, is uh, a feedback loop between an aerodynamic solver, which is this unsteady vortex lattice, a, distri a distribution of uh, circulation, which we basically discretize everywhere. Typically, we have for the other 30,000 states or more. This is for that particular example. Uh, and then we have B models, which are nonlinear, so that we can have that interaction between the two uh, in time domain. So we have uh, this solve for external excitations, which typically come from the atmosphere. So what I'm putting here is a time history of inflow velocities that the wind turbine would see on a particular setup that we we put it to, to work. And for those, we need additional models uh, that uh, describe what's going on on the atmospheric boundary layer at the particular location of the wind turbine. So, click on something which I don't know what it is. My mouse is not. No, hold on. There's something wrong, but I don't know what it is. Uh, okay, there you go. So, uh, the final element, I haven't put anything specifically on it, is uh, that all these dynamic effects basically drive uh, fatigue of components, either at the blade structure, the tower foundation, or are the nacelle uh, mechanical sy subsystems or electrical systems. And all of those break at different times during the life of a wind turbine. One of the issues that the very large wind turbines are finding is that the life of the components is very often not as long as the original life was intended. Uh, and that's been uh, one of the, the key drivers on, on, on developing technology. Um, I haven't got any questions for a bit. I, I assume you guys are tired by now as well. <laughs> uh, but if you have any any comments, please, uh, I'm mean, still monitoring the the chat here. Yes, Andy. Hi, Rafa. Sorry, I'm just pressed it by accident again. Every time I click on something, I always click on the hand. <laughs> every, time, every time someone has a question, you kind of go. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a coincidence you're asking for questions and I click. Okay, no, yeah. It's, okay, but it's, is anyone awake still around here? It's, you know, it's, I'm in my bedroom. It's odd. Uh, I thought I'd say something to keep you company for a bit. Hey, you got a question? Then. Hey, Jin Chen. Thank you. Hey, hi, hi. Nice talk. Well, so I was just wondering, like, you sure I've also carried out the large ID simulations before, and. Yeah. Uh, uh, my re my resolve the near week is quite different from the one you showed with very clear uh, nice structure. So I was wondering, is that because of we we you we are using different uh, turbulence level? Uh, 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 the one you're showing with yes. very nice, uh, absolutely. So the, this is so clean. Uh, for for this to be so clean, you have to have a very very nice uh, flow condition. Okay. So the, this is intimately linked to in which conditions the wind turbine is performing. Uh, and that, that has to do with two things. One is the Reynolds number in which you are solving the simulation. This is a very high Reynolds number situation. Uh, and second, what is the incoming uh, turbulence levels that you are putting through? In reality, things break way faster uh, for most radar problems. And when you're inside a farm, absolutely yes. Uh, I mean, I put that cartoon from Jorgos because it's just beautiful. Okay, he got there. That actually got an award to the best uh, CFD plot and some UK competition. Uh, it, it's just, yeah. it's just, a, uh, it's just a, a brilliant one. But it's, it's as approximate as what you put into the model. So LES is, uh, is a beast, as you are finding yourself, or anyone that uh, has an interest in that, because you move away from turbulence modeling which is what uh, these uh, lower fidelity methods, uh, Reynolds average number stocks is doing. But you still has a modeling aspect there, which is where you put filters on the flow at the very far, at the very high scales. And that one is, is an art in itself in terms of getting those numbers right. The, it needs a lot of calibration for the numbers to, to be available. Florian? Yeah, I was just wondering um, whether you've you've shown a graph uh, earlier where you showed like the hysteresis between the angle of attack and the lift coefficients. Yep. I was just wondering whether you've ever used the gorman grabrov model or whether you've come across that model before, because that models basically that effect and it only uses the, the lift curve um, as an input and then the, 
the um, pitching frequency, and it gives quite good results. But it's it's for sure it's a two D and very simple model. Uh, it should be equivalent, isn't it? Uh, because they, effectively this is what it does. So I mean that that becomes a, a correction factor once you are given the uh, the frequency of oscillation. So I haven't used that particular model, but I would expect it to be as simple as the one I presented. Yeah, it's it's a very it's a very simple state model. Okay. Exactly. I mean, this is it. I mean, this you can model that with uh, one state on the airfoil. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's effectively it. That's what I, I assume that you you looked at on, on that case. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, well, that, of course, it, it, you have relatively fast dynamics, and it's not that that the airfoil is moving fast. It can be also the incoming flow perturbations, which also are modulated by that. So, the fact that you have fluctuations on on the incoming flow velocity, and they build that into lift with a time scale delay. And if you don't put that, actually you had on an overshoot or on those excitations. When well, you need to put these unstable dynamic terms into the into the picture. Okay. Uh, you guys want I can just continue then on, on my last and this is only a few last slides on uh, issues uh, on control. And again, I, I, I'm, here, I'm focusing here on how we are approaching this in, in my lab. Uh, because uh, as you saw first is uh, dynamic elasticity is defines a linear state phase system so any linear control method works uh, depending on what you are after you will basically look for different features of the the, the control um, architecture uh, at the wind turbine uh, level uh, most uh, uh, Controllers installed on actual wind turbines are of the PAV shape. So what you're having is a way to basically enforce that they, depending on the wind speed, you stick to your uh, power curve. And that basically is just uh, spinning the, the, the blade faster or slower and changing the pitch angle such that you meet those conditions. And this becomes very trivial indeed. So I'm talking about uh, a few more complicated things here in terms of uh, some other things that uh, may may occur. So the first example I, I wanted to, to show, and I referred to this early on, is I put this in a control, but it's a design feature that you can embed on the wind turbines. Something that we refer to as our elastic tailoring. So as you need to operate an increasingly large uh, uh, wind speeds and the wind uh, and the blade will deform, uh, you want that deformation to be sh to uh, to be beneficial to you in some way. So uh, a classical case, and I go back to my roots in aerospace engineering, is uh, forward swept aircraft uh, design. So these are beautiful aircraft. You see, this is a 1980s design, uh, which don't fly. It's very hard to get a, an aircraft with a forward swept because uh, are elastically, these wings very quickly get into a feedback between the formations and, and, and forces, and they, they break apart. Uh, so what happens on those wings is that the, the wind wind uh, bends because of lift, it also pitches up. And when you pitch up, it's very hard to keep the, the winds uh, stiff enough. So composites uh, play a role here. Using composite materials on the fundamental uh, structure of the, of the wind allows you to tailor the structural properties. And by tailoring means you put the laminate orientations, which basically have a, 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 a symmetric behavior, such that when uh, you have forces in one direction uh, start to pitch on the other axis by basically making the, the laminates uh, to have an angle against the, the, the span direction. It's a very simple concept to, to build, and indeed that was tested on, on that wind uh, for that plane, and uh, it flew. It didn't prove to be beneficial enough for uh, aircraft applications, so there is minimal amount of aerostatic tailoring uh, on aircraft wings. However, in, in wind turbines has been one of the most successful developments over the last few years. As wind turbines became larger, elastic tailoring became an, an, an essential way to keep those forces at bay. And what are these? And this is, I mean, this is the, the, the sort of cartoon that you would see in those cases. You just design the structure uh, such that uh, there is this uh, bending twisting coupling, and the bending twisting coupling happen on the on, on the right direction, bending up, twisting down. Uh, Trying to think of number, but I don't. I don't have a number on the top of my head. So uh, I, I know all the large Siemens wind turbines, for instance, are, are made uh, on this uh, on this architecture. 
Uh, second, uh, I, I talked about this before, so I don't need to say much more. So when you understand the control, typically is against uh, the fluctuation. So you have this PID, which basically keeps the wind turbine in this nominal condition, but then the next level is going to be uh, dealing with uh, external uh, fluctuation. So the, the key one will be uh, the turbulent atmospheric condition. So we did an exercise on a couple of years ago, so I'm referring to that one as an example of what you can achieve there. Uh, the first thing is we need a model of uh, what's going on in the atmosphere, and those have been tabulated in terms of codified on wind energy design. So there is this uh, standard, uh, International Electro Something Commission, uh, which basically tells you what is that you should expect to see in, in, in a wind field. It uses a very particular model of turbulence, which is a, the simplest one. It's not say it's not very accurate for what you would expect to see, but it's a normalized situation. So when you design against it and you observe it against experiments, you start seeing correlations between design features and actual observations. Uh, it has to use wind shear. This is the, the, the distribution of velocities as you go with, with the axis. And there is a law there, which is the power law, which uh, we use in this particular case. And then we need to pick the wind speed in which we're operating and we went for a particular wind turbine, the 5 megawatt uh, 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 NREL uh, turbine, which is a, uh, an open source uh, kind of model uh, on the nominal conditions, 11 meters a second operational. And then we pick our turbulence intensity, which is part of the ISC um, uh, levels. This is a very high turbulent wind condition. This is basically turbulent field, which is about 20%, 17% fluctuation with respect to the incoming flow velocity. Okay, now for anything that I'm presenting, then you need to do this in time domain. Uh, so we basically uh, build a wind turbine model within various controllers, so I will talk in about in a second, and then we run a lot of statistics as we're running this on, on turbulent fields. We have this kind of 10 minutes, uh, one hour worth of uh, statistics to obtain, obtain data out of it. Uh, what is that we see? Let me see if I managed to get this working. I don't know what I click. Uh, the first thing we did is to actually test our elastic tailoring on those. So our elastic tailoring meant uh, we have originally a wind turbine with uh, bending and torsional uh, stiffness uh, as separated ones. So you apply bending force and it bends up and you apply torsional force and, and twists. And twists. So now we have a coupling term which we call alpha, which basically introduces a coupling between bending and twisting. When it bends, it twists and vice versa. And that comes to the structural properties of the wind turbine. And then what we did there is to basically modify that alpha from zero nominal conditions to positive value. This is when it twists, it twists, when it bends, it twists up, and negative value when it bends, it twists down. Just to see the effect in terms of the forces. And then we have uh, the various metrics here are this is the normalized to one value of the root mean square value of the root bending moment, as well as the root mean square value of the torsional moment. Those are the key uh, forces that you will have. And then we have the for and hour uh, and after motion, uh, motions that we also uh, look at. This is the in-play mode, bend, bending mode, and then the torsional mode. Uh, and then uh, on top of the room mean square, which is a mean value, we also look at the maximum, the peak values of the forces as, uh, to have a second metric. And those are these numbers. And those are a scale with a bit two to one over that one. So the peak value on the root bending moment of our, our series uh, was about four times higher than the mean value. Okay, in all these 10 series, we have some sort of peak, and those are the ones we were monitoring. And then what we're looking is what is the effect of this aeroelastic tailoring on the, uh, those average uh, statistical responses. So when we introduce aeroelastic tailoring in a positive fashion, so bending up, twisting down, so we go in this direction on the curve, you would, what you see is that it lowers quite uh, rapidly the uh, bending forces. Uh, but it actually has a uh, contracting effect on the torsional forces, and this typically is uh, what you get to see in any of these problems. So it reduces what actually tends to bend the, the wind up, but it generates a higher force on the torsional degree of freedom. Uh, and if we do it the other direction, then it becomes the other way around. It becomes very quickly uh, very bad. So you get the arrested turn in the one direction, which you, you are doing is amplifying the effect of uh, deformation. 
Okay, so this is kind of intuitive. This is what you would see on the steady, in the steady analysis. We also do this on unsteady analysis as well. The next level is uh, you need to uh, or you want to define a closed loop uh, system. So the way we went about defining a closed loop system for a wind turbine is we added a flap, as I was defining before for the potential flow theory, and indeed we use those sort of theories to estimate the performance of the flap. Uh, this is our actuator system. Uh, then we have the on top of that we have the standard actuator system, which will be the the pitch of the blade. The whole blade can be moving pitch uh, uh, through an actuator at the root. Then we have our sensors, and we just use uh, root bending moment. Uh, as a sensing for feedback on the control system. And then we're looking in this case, very simple control uh, architecture. So we just define an H infinity controller for that, pl uh, the, that problem and the H infinity controller. So we have a linear time invariant system. We build it on a single blade uh, input to output on the blade, and then we attach that one on the full rotor. Okay, we have information about the, rot the elasticity of the blade, but we have information about the interaction between the blades on the, on the full rotor. Uh, uh, and we basically put those as part of the uncertainty on, on, on the model. And then we look into how uh, actuating, you need to put uh, uh, margins for, for saturation. We put margins in terms of uh, maximum displacement and maximum rate of, uh, of flood displacement. And then what we looked at is how uh, these, uh, our particular choice of, of, of gains on the H infinity produce uh, reduction in loads. And we obtain these sort of typical values of 13% reduction in forces uh, on bending forces. That's what you expect to see from the flap. Uh, but then uh, a penalization on the torsional forces. And that's always the case. They do, we designed to improve performance on, on bending. We got worse performance on torsion. Torsion typically is not a, a design criteria. So we are happy to, to have larger forces there and move the forces from, from bending down in, into that aspect. Okay. This is a, a typical X scenario. How this looks like when you actually put this in, in a, a time series, this is the power spectral density of the root bending moment uh, against the frequency uh, on a particular blade on those uh, long time histories. So the blue line here is the open loop uh, force that you see. This is the big peak here is the, the periodic the cyclic motions, and the various other peaks are associated to structural uh, peaks. Uh, then what we have is, as, we, as, as soon as we did the elastic uh, tailoring aspects into the problem, we put a factor of elastic tailoring. We target very nicely this, uh, uh, this peak, bringing it down. Uh, but then uh, elastic tailoring, which becomes this black line, had a penalty on the high frequency oscillations on the forces. So in that case, what we did is to use this active method with the flap to basically target the high frequency. Uh, and having the ability to manipulate the wind blade using a bit of passive mechanisms and a bit of active mechanisms is, is the winning combination, of course, uh, to achieve performance across. So then we move down the, the high frequency con content uh, uh, mainly through, through the actuation system there. Uh, the, so you know, I, I, I did this exercise, so we did with as a PhD student a, a few years ago, this exercise with flaps. In reality, wind turbines don't have flaps. It's very hard to convince any wind turbine developer uh, to actually put moving parts inside the blades, because once you put that up there at uh, 150 meters high, uh, it's very hard to maintain. They are moving parts. So it's uh, a technology which is under investigation, but right now the key technology to try to do anything on control on the rotor is just uh, manipulating the pitch. The pitch is the root uh, uh, setting in terms of uh, um, uh, angular uh, angle of attack of the of the whole blade. Now that works, as you would expect, much much slower. So this is a, a very slow sort of actuation compared to a flap, uh, but it has a lot of authority because you're moving the whole blade at once. So what we did is a, is a simple exercise trying to get our best pitch uh, controller versus a flat controller to get some numbers of what we should expect to see on, on, on a wind turbine blade. So I just put these numbers here to get you another money to do what to see. This is reduction in forces. So we're looking at the root mean square of root bending forces. 
Uh, and this is uh, a metric which is limit, uh, linked to that. You can post-process the, the time history of forces to generate something called the damage equivalent load. It's a model of what is the effect that they will have on fatigue, but they are very close numbers, as you will say. Uh, then if you are looking at flaps, uh, we were on the order of what I just saw before, 15. In this case, 15. Uh, I saw before 13. This is 15% on this particular condition. That's typical numbers. You are trying to do this through uh, cyclic pitch control. That means all three wind turbines moving on a single controller. Uh, it might have a, a phase delay between the three, but the three are acting simultaneously. Then we got on the order of 27-28% uh, of uh, load reduction, so it's twice the, the effect of a flap. Uh, a different level is when you actually do what is called uh, individual pitch control. Each wind turbine is active independently. So you have a wind turbine with its own angle and the other one with the, which is shown pitch control and each of them is manipulated by a different actuator which basically doesn't need to know about the other. In those cases you achieve an additional advantage of performance and we went all the way down to 32% reduction. But the, the beauty of, uh, uh, of our study is that uh, when we put together this individual peak control with the uh, flaps, we got a, almost a linear superposition of effects because the, the individual pitch control works at the lower frequency end and the flaps operate at the high frequency at forces. So mostly they, com they, they complement each other to get uh, almost half reduction of forces, which was pretty nice to see. So this is how typically, and just I believe this on, on my own examples, uh, how typically you will do uh, control of our elastic force you know, on, on wind turbine blades. And these models are based on, on these unsteady vortex lattice models. Uh, the other problem is uh, something that uh, 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 Jin Chen and Arturo have been talking about this week, uh, which is uh, how you actually do control at the level of a farm. And uh, this is a, uh, one of those LES simulations we were running in which we have two uh, rotors and the two rotors basically interacting with each other and uh, what you get to see is of course the second one will have a very very nasty flow to to operate so the approach in this case is to basically move the wakes from the top uh, uh, the front rotor such that uh, you minimize the effect that it will have on the lower on, on, on the ones downstream uh, these as I was saying uh, is requires a different level of fidelity on the on the fluid dynamics, so these simulations are typically done now with these LES models. This is the, the very expensive simulations and uh, the Navier-Stokes equations. But to be able to actually drive the optimization problem, you cannot do optimization directly on these very expensive simulations. So what we do is to build surrogate models. Uh, the surrogate models of choice uh, for most people working in this area is something called FLORIS, which I listed up here. Uh, FLORIS is another NREL uh, tool is a, is, a, is a computer package which basically fits a few coefficients on what you expect to see on a wake of a wind turbine. Uh, and what we did is basically uh, uh, compute a, a number of simulations on, on two turbines. These are the simulations you see here on the left. And using the coefficients to uh, train our Flores models. And when you have a Flores models, then we use a standard uh, quadratic method for, uh, for optimization. Uh, since everything we do is train on, wind, on two wind turbines, then we need to see the performance that they will have on the full uh, farm. So the final stage on the process is to actually check how the whole thing performs on full farm uh, and see whether the assumption of two rotors become uh, sufficient or not. So this is how the Florida model looks like. This is the black line. This is how the red model looks like. And these are different uh, string-wise locations uh, as, as we go down the rotor. So what we did is a first exercise of basically a parameter fit. Uh, once we have a Floris model, then we run these optimizations, which are very quick on, on Floris. And once we got those results, we went back to the full farm and check actually what is operating. So what you are seeing here is the aggregate of a 16 wind turbine farm model uh, on power. Uh, on particular conditions, so we were at some velocity just below uh, rated conditions uh, with a turbulence level. Uh, we did our optimization in, in Flores, and then we basically set up two different settings for, for the optimization. One is what we refer to as a greedy uh, operation, so all wind turbines are trying to maximize their performance. Basically, they are aligned to the flow, 
then you see these huge decays in performance. Uh, then we have what we refer to as a cooperative uh, setting in which the wind turbines uh, change their alignment uh, to have uh, basically a, a global effect which becomes beneficial. And then you see this very large uh, evolution or uh, jump in the, in the evolution of the time history of, of the power between the two. Uh, what you get to see here is the uh, mean power uh, at the very rows of the wind turbine. So if you are in a uh, greedy controller, what you have is a very, very good performance on the very first row, mm -hmm. then a huge degradation, nearly half of the power as you go down to the second row and, and, and so forth, and so on and so forth. When we did this cooperative, we decrease a bit of performance on the first one, but then increase quite substantially uh, the, the performance on the, on the turbines downstream. And what this is showing is the, the room in the square on the forces, which again is, is how much the fluctuation happens, the, the impact of the wake directly on the wind turbines downstream. But that's going to be linked to uh, the loading that appears and effectively the, 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 the fatigue that occurs. However, I must say on, the, on these results that we didn't do this in our elasticity, so we don't really are able at this stage to do fatigue. Okay, So this is just an dynamic model. The next level of analysis here is to make these problems in an elastic setting, in which case uh, we have this information of what's going on the, at the level of the of the wind blade, and that's the one that affects fundamentally the forces that appear. So fatigue would be driven by by those effects. Yes, Pietro. Yeah, just uh, a question: like, what is the intuition behind in the upper right graph, where you yep. have the cooperative one, then you have a yep. peak again in the last rows, right? You can yep. see that in the fourth row, you have almost 70%. And why, why do we have such a behavior? Why does it rise again? Well, uh, let me, yeah, yeah, let me see if I, I get to see a plot here. Uh, there is a, I uh, don't think I have a nice one, actually, because we, we see some, some plots on those. The, the, the intuition there, let me show any of this, just to put a, a cartoon. Okay, you have this, you are deflecting the, the, the flows here, okay? You have this sort of, uh, a steering of the wake, correct? Now, yeah. the wind turbines, so what, what this is also doing is generating a sort of a, um, a channeling, I think is the right word to use here, on the flow as you go downstream. Okay, so it's, it's like putting a, 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 um, a case around the, the rotor. And this okay. is an uh, this has an uh, uh, it's an uh, it's an acceleration of the flow, which basically generates more power. Okay, but they okay. are staggered, so they they are not in line. Uh, the different turbines they are staggered the, a bit, right? They no, but the, the, you stagger them by the fact that you have this the jaw. The, the jaw basically generates ah, okay uh, the, generates this channel that goes around this. That's an acceleration of the flow, and actually when you put the wind turbine there, as you go downstream, those ones which are down there, they start to benefit from that effect as the accumulation of the previous wakes. Okay. Ah, okay. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a secondary effect that comes from the fact that actually you do have this these wave profiles with a fluctuation of velocities and you manipulate those to actually achieve more performance because you have a higher wind on the particular wind blade downstream. Okay. It's, ah, it's a okay, bit different okay. effect when you look into the data. Uh, and uh, yeah, I don't have a nice cartoon here for that, but actually it, it, it's linked to this. And you see it, it goes up quite dramatically, which is. Yeah, exactly. Right. Someone co commenting on that as well? No, that's okay. Okay, but that, that's the fundamental. Now, how much of this is universal? I wouldn't know. Okay. So that's what we are seeing in our simulations. But again, it's one thing uh, to start from a, a, a single set of simulations, the other to go into the scale of what happens on the real wind turbine with fluctuating velocities. How much of these effects start to drop? I still don't have an answer to that. Jin Chen, you have a lot more experience than me on this. Tell me. Uh, I was thinking about maybe there's also an effect of turbulence. Like it, it, when, it, when the wakes travel further downstream, the turbulence level goes high, goes higher, so that mm -hmm. the wake recover recovers faster. Is that also an effect? Well, but you still have the previous one. So yes, the effect from the first to the fourth row goes like that. But you, start, you still have the third row ahead of the fourth row, which technically is the, is the same. So uh, in terms of distance. So yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. What, there is an aspect of that, but I don't think this is the driver on that on the physics here. 
Yeah, but so, if it's uh, the increase of speed uh, for the downstream turbines, it, yep. then I, I'm wondering the the impact is quite high uh, in the power generation. I, yep. I, I I don't know whether that will be enough or not for this high, uh, like this amount of energy. Yeah, well, I mean, it goes at the cube, don't forget. Yeah. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's one, one of the key drivers is that velocity really, really drives power. Uh, uh, spectacular because of the uh, uh, power of uh, 3 as I saw early on. That's what these very simple models become useful to keep in mind for this analysis. So, uh, actuator disk is very approximate, but you should expect those sort of trade offs. Okay, uh, that's my last slide. Uh, so, Things to remember, well, that uh, if you like elasticity, you need to be aware that you need to deal with finite element models in structures and CFD of various kinds and dynamics, which I personally like a lot, but that means you need to keep a, a tab on a lot of physics simultaneously. Uh, for wind turbines, it drives uh, these dynamic loads, so fatigue effects, which are, are a, a key driver on design. Uh, that basically is how stiff you make it and what you make with them, but also the, the shape that you have uh, of the wind turbine. And then what I said is we need to come around with much lower fidelity models to be able to do control system design, but then on the on this very complex physics problem, we need to test them on, on, on these very, very complex setups. So uh, as you've seen in my own group, I've been working across all fidelities, and part of this is because there is a particular uh, there is no particular tool that works everywhere. So you need something, you need to answer certain problems on control, you need to address certain other problems on design, and of course you have the full fidelity, which needs a, a, a very, very large uh, uh, computer model. Florian. I just have another, another question. Um, I was wondering whether you've ever looked into active flow control or whether this is something that's still considered in the wind turbine business. Uh, whether I have looked myself, the answer is not directly. I'm very much aware of what's going on there. Uh, I mean, it's been looked at for wind turbine applications for a long time because it's an aerodynamic flow in which you can achieve performance by just manipulating flows, as you would expect. But it has the same issue as... Uh, the flaps I was mentioning before, you are talking about that, then you have to install systems on the blades of various kinds. Okay, you can do blowing and sucking, that's one of those classic uh, actuator systems uh, to manipulate the boundary layers, or you can do things on the trading edge, you name it. Uh, the challenge is always the same, is how you put a system which becomes robust uh, for very long time performance. Okay, typically, wind turbines are designed for 25 years operation uh, and minimum maintenance if possible. Mm. So, uh, if uh, any actuating system basically pays its use, and, and that includes the maintenance is, is low enough that it becomes uh, fundamentally economical, I'm sure it will have a, a, a space on, 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 on next generation winter rides. But I don't know of any which is to the level of being near uh, Deployment. Okay. Okay. The the most yeah anything I've seen which basically makes it to a wind turbine are passive systems, and the ones that come to mind recently is uh, uh, systems to reduce acoustic uh, noise. So you might have seen these wind turbines with uh, serrated train edge. There's a modification mm -hmm. of the basic design, uh, and those are put in because they have a benefit with uh, no cost effectively. Uh, so it has to go, basically, this is a good example of what makes the, its way into a design. All right. Perfect, yeah, thanks. Any other question, comment before we close the morning? All good then?